Dear Mario Greco, dear distinguished representatives of our people innovation ecosystem, the global HR Valley, dear colleagues and students, esteemed guests. On behalf of the University of Zurich and especially the Center for Leadership in the Future of Work and the Europa Institute, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to the second edition of the University of Zurich uh, lecture series on leadership in the future of work. As we convene here, we find ourselves at a critical juncture where companies and the workforce face numerous global challenges. These challenges transcend borders and demand cooperative and innovative solutions. Three major issues are at the forefront of our global agenda. Generative AI, climate change, and the geopolitical tensions. Let me comment just on the first one. At the G7 meeting in Hiroshima, the Science and Technology and Society Forum in Kyoto and the Swiss-Japanese Economic Forum uh, in Tokyo that I attended last October, generative AI was the hot topic. With its promise to enhance productivity and enabling countless new applications, it has the potential to revolutionize industries. However, it also presents a double-edged sword. On one hand, AI promises tremendous opportunities, making processes more efficient and introducing new solutions. Yet the disruptive power of AI also raises concerns about the future of work. While we can anticipate significant job displacement, there is the potential for the creation of new, more specialized roles in AI development, maintenance and ethical oversight. To address this, we must work together on national and international policy responses to ensure a just transition, reskilling, upskilling opportunities for those affected, and safeguarding against AI bias and misuse. In this endeavor, industry academia collaborations are extremely important. As we navigate this transformative period, let's consider both the positive and negative impacts of AI in the context of the future of work. Researchers at the University of Zurich and elsewhere have been using AI to improve medical diagnostics, environmental monitoring, or to tackle climate change. However, there is also the potential for job displacement, increased surveillance, and reinforcement of existing inequalities. If not carefully managed, uh, this can lead into serious problems. It is imperative that we strike a balance utilizing AI as a tool to empower our workforce rather than replace it. I am glad that the Center for Leadership in the Future of Work at the University of Zurich with its partners is pushing this agenda forward. Professor Jochen Menges, co-founder of the Global HR Valley and director of the center, can certainly tell you more about this transition. Under his leadership, we innovate the future of work through the research that we do to generate evidence, through the people we educate to be change leaders of tomorrow, and through events such as tonight that stimulate the co-creation of the future of work for us all. The lecture series on leadership in the future of work has been designed to bring people together from academia, business, government, and civil society, both young and not so young, both local and from further away. It is part of our efforts to establish a people innovation ecosystem to shape the future of work for the better. Thank you for being here today, and I'm looking forward to an inspiring evening. Now, before Jennifer Sparr will take over to introduce our guest speaker in a little bit more detail, we'll have a short view on a video produced by the center. Thank you very much for your attention. The 
University of Zurich's Center for Leadership in the Future of Work is the beating heart of the world's first people innovation ecosystem, the global HR Valley. We bring various stakeholders across society together around one common purpose, to shape a more human future of work. We do this through three core activities that mutually reinforce each other, discover, inspire, and shape. Our research explores how people can be lifted up to feel and do their best at work. Across our research, we use rigorous scientific methods and state-of-the-art technology. We are connected across the world to bring scholars together to study the human side of the future of work. We inspire current and future leaders to prepare themselves and their organizations for a changing world of work. Our innovative learning journeys equip leaders with specific expertise in the human aspects of the future of work. Our evidence-based leadership development programs have been globally recognized as among the best in the world. We bring together business and stakeholders across society to address people's challenges in collaboration. And so we ignite an entire people innovation ecosystem to incubate human-centered solutions for the future of work. We don't want to wait for the future of work to just happen to us. We proactively want to shape it. As part of our efforts to bring people together to build a better future of work, we welcome you tonight to the University of Zurich's lecture series on leadership in the future of work. Thank you for joining us tonight and let's lead the future together. Good evening and a very warm welcome also from my side. I want to begin by thanking our University Vice President, Professor Dr. Christian Schwarzenegger, for his inspirational words and for his vigorous support for our efforts to shape the future of work. Thank you so much, Christian. I also would like to thank the Dean of the Faculty of Business, Economics and Informatics, Professor Dr. Harald Geil, to join us tonight. And I would like to thank Andreas Kellerhals, the director of the Europa Institute, here you are, um, who has kindly supported us from the very beginning, and of course also his team from the Europa Institute for helping with the organization of the evening. Thank you. Um, speaking of the organization of this evening, I want to thank our fantastic team at the Center for Leadership in the Future of Work um, for all the amazing work um, they did to organize today's lecture. Especially my dear colleagues, Professor Dr. Jochen Menges and Lisette Cabrera, who is not in the room, but I hope she can still hear it. Um, and you can recognize the members of our center tonight by wearing those name tags. So if you have a question, please approach our team members. Everyone is very glad to help. Finally, I would like to thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to be here tonight and to learn about how to lead in the future of work. You are the people innovation ecosystem. It is through your interests and initiative that we can collectively shape the future of work for the better. So um, this is the program for tonight. In the next 20 minutes or so, we are elated to listen to Mario Greco as he will share his insights on leading through uncertainty, harnessing resilience, and building vision for the future of work. Afterwards, Professor Menges will start a discussion with a couple of questions for Mario Greco, and then we'll open up the floor for questions from all of you. So while you're listening um, to the talk of Mario Greco, please feel free to think 
of questions you would, would like to ask afterwards. Then we will invite you to an apero down in the beautiful Lichthof to mingle with other forward-thinking people. Look around, that's you. So now, without further ado, let me introduce our distinguished speaker for tonight, Mr. Mario Greco, the CEO of the Zurich Insurance Group. As we navigate an era characterized by technological disruption, sustainability challenges, and rapidly changing work environments, it is crucial for us all to learn from the insights and experiences of leaders who are shaping these transformations firsthand, such as Mr. Greco. Mr. Greco started his career in management consulting at McKinsey and Company in Milan, where he became a partner, eventually leading the insurance department. He then um, took his talents directly to three insurance companies, first RAS, which is part of the Allianz Group in Milan, um, then Zurich Insurance Group, and Generali. Mr. Greco's unwavering commitment to the insurance industry led him back to Zurich Insurance Group, where he served first as the CEO of Global Life, then CEO of General Insurance, and since 2016, he is the group CEO. A truly remarkable career. Let me also highlight that in addition to his corporate achievements, Mr. Greco is deeply committed to academia and the advancement of knowledge. As is evident through his engagement with Bocconi University, the University of St. Gallen, ETH, and our university, the University of Zurich. Mr. Greco has gathered crucial insights into how leadership has been changing for the better and the worse in business and beyond. We are deeply grateful that he is sharing those insights with us tonight. Please join me in a warm welcome from, for Mario Greco and um, to welcome him to the stage. Mr. Greco, the stage is you. Thank you very much for joining us. So um, thank you very much all, and thank you, Professor Schwarzenegger, Professor Mengus. Um, I, I don't quite understand why you invited me. I mean, I'm no professor, I'm not an expert, uh, but I do bear, which is probably the reason um, why I'm here, a true interest in the future of labor. Labor is so important and it's so um, impactful on, on your life. And so I'll try to give you my view of what's going on and I will connect uh, immediately to uh, what you said before on AI and uh, uh, the future of labor under AI. Now bear in mind that um, in all the studies around uh, this uh, theme of labor and AI, insurance industry is uh, sorted out as one of the most impacted sector. Estimates of the impact go from 40 to even 60% of labor impacted, and, and impacted is a nice word to say that uh, there would be no need for people anymore. Um, and this is quite typical of service industries, um, and insurance is a service industry. So that's why also the question for me is incredibly important of what kind of future are we building for our colleagues, for our companies, and for the societies in which we live in. But let me start from uh, maybe a different viewpoint, and I'm going to talk for a second about uh, um, a famous, at least in my time, a famous economist. His name is Vasily Leontiev. He won a Nobel Prize <laughs> in 1973. Um, and I was a student of economics, and I was very impressed by what he was writing. Now, in the early 80s, um, he started writing a series of papers on technological progress. Now, there is a definition in economics, which I believe uh, can be attributed to Keynes. A lot of things in economics go back to John Maynard Keynes, and that's the definition of technological unemployment. Um, I believe, we believe, that this was invented by Keynes. Now, Leontief was uh, writing about economic cycles in growth, and he was very uh, concerned about the role of technology um, on humans and labor. Now, interesting enough, he started, however, not from humans, but he started from horses. 
And they draw a similarity, a comparison between horses and humans. And now, remember that at the, um, a century and a half ago, so around 1870, 1880, horses were really at the center of business life. They worked together with humans. Farmers depended on horses. Mobility was uh, driven by horses. In industries even, uh, we're having horses everywhere, right? And we were all thinking on horse powers. Now, see what happened uh, from, from that standpoint. I think 1870 was uh, uh, the first internal com combustion engine was built, 1870. Now, in the 1880s, this was installed in the first automobile. Um, roughly one decade after, Harry Ford started developing his Model T. So he started uh, commercializing you know, automobiles for everybody. By 1910, in New York, there were many more automobiles than horses. Horses started disappearing from the city. And the last horse was decommissioned in 1917 um, in New York from uh, riding uh, the trams, the transport station in New York. Horse disappeared. Now, that's the time in roughly 40 years when horses abandoned the working force and they started a new life. And horses matters for us only for leisure and for sport. If it weren't for leisure and sport, horse, horse could disappear. They will not exist anymore, right? Now, the problem, and why I'm saying this, the problem is that Leontief, uh, back in the 80s, said this is going to happen to humans. And I was always impressed by this vision and by this forecast. And of course, at the time, I had no idea of AI and I no idea that this might come true. Uh, but I still remember that. And so when I, when I was asked about this, uh, um, this, this opportunity, I started rethinking about uh, the lesson or uh, those papers of, of a while ago. Um, so is this fear real? Yes, I think it's real. Um, and so it, it is justified all the anxiety that is creating around the societies and around the people because AI is a different thing. Now, of course, I'm mindful of the fact that nothing happens suddenly. Um, as I said, with the horses, it took 40 years to expel them from the, base, from the business world, from the labor force. Um, it will take much longer for us humans. Um, but it is happening already on the other side. So it's not an hypothetical risk. It is something that we see already these days. I'm also well aware that uh, since the beginning of human life, we have also been troubled with the idea that every development uh, will make some harm, and then we should defend and protect us as humans. And we have done it very well over the years. But it was different before. A lot of the innovation that happened during the Industrial Revolution was innovation that uh, hit the highest paid jobs and works, and so democratized, in a sense, activities and allowed low-skilled workers, which of course were abandoned, to manage through technology jobs that previously were only managed by very high-skilled and high-paid workers. The problem today is that the opposite is happening. So it, it is low-skilled workers who are the first and the most attacked by AI, and the high-skilled workers still have their jobs secured and still have their high pays secured. Uh, now, uh, why, why is artificial intelligence creating all this? Because artificial intelligence is not just uh, a technique. Artificial intelligence, and, and I, I guess it all started uh, uh, with um, uh, the effort to make computers uh, play against humans and win against humans. You know that uh, the first Achievement was when AlphaGo won um, in, in, in the Go, in, in the Japanese game, uh, which was supposed to be um, unbeatable, um, where the humans were supposed to be unbeatable, and instead the computer won it. And after that, they developed it for chess. 
and they figure out that the computer doesn't even know, need to know chess, can learn chess by itself, can play chess by itself, and by doing that, you know, the computer is going to win humans 100 times out of 100 games. Um, and so computers started to become intelligent. Intelligence means that they think like us and they can anticipate. And this is what then we see today with ChatGPT and we see today with the applications that we start having in the different industries where computers do things that usually we do. And they do things that actually we do as administrative work, as bureaucratic work. Now, uh, estimates today is that um, in the US, people earning less than $40,000 per year are 14 times more likely to lose jobs than people on higher wages. And this matters because, as I will say in a second, this will uh, um, make much worse the problem of inequality that we're facing all around the world. The people who are the most hit today, and probably for the next year, so will be the people at the lowest uh, wages and the people who have less alternatives for their future. Um, by 2030, the estimates are, whatever the estimates can say today, because AI is progressing at an exponential rate, so every estimate has a risk of being just uh, not properly assessing the situation. But the estimates today is that there will be um, 12 million employees that will need in the US um, retraining, reskilling, and new occupations. Now, 80% of these people will be in some specific jobs area. Many of them matters for us in insurance, like customer service, um, like food service. And these are all things that you probably are aware as I am. I mean, you have seen the changes in food service. You've seen the changes in customer service. Well, call center are progressively replaced by bots. And bots means computer. Um, office support, uh, production. This area will concentrate initially the first wave of attack of robots, computer replacing humans. Now, I don't think that I can say to tonight that we will be able to replace this job. We will not. Uh, this is massive, and this is just the first wave, and this will continue. Um, and not all dislocated workers will find um, the way to participate to the job market anymore. Yes, one solution will be declining participation. <coughs> Excuse me. COVID helped us already on that. I mean, COVID already gave um, a hit to the, particip to the participation rate. Um, but even that will not, will, not, will not be enough. Now, what are the consequences of this? I mentioned one, which is the growth of inequalities. And you know how deep and uh, relevant is the issue of inequalities already today, it will get much worse. The second thing um, will be the concentration of power. And again, we have seen that already because um, the development of AI means that few companies will own a lot of data, which is what AI is all about, and will have the capacity to own the capital that is needed to run these businesses. And so there would be a fundamental issue about uh, the power of individual companies versus the power of citizens, versus the power of states, governments. And the third one, um, the third risk that we're facing with all this is lack of purpose. Because we might find our job heavy, or we might find our job unpleasant, but it gives us a purpose in the world. And if you're without a job, as uh, uh, you know, some of us have experienced, and I experienced that myself, you really feel that you, you're, not, you're not precisely anywhere in the world. So lack of purpose is the third risk that I see for us. Now, let me also, let me also spend a few more words on the issue of inequality. Today, uh, the labor market and the labor opportunities are the main way that we have to share economic prosperity. Fundamentally, through labor, uh, we have, I cannot say equal opportunities, but fair opportunities for all of us to progress and to make whatever we want to do of our life. Um, in a world with much less labor, how will these opportunities be available for people? How the access to these opportunities will be 
possible for people. That's not clear. And when I say that's not clear, I have a guess that that will be less available. And so this will trigger um, quickly uh, a sense of inequality and a sense of unfairness. Um, now, of course, even today, there is a lot of inequality in the labor market. And the labor market is far from being today fair in the way the different jobs are remunerated. Uh, but there are jobs. And the future that I'm afraid we will have to consider is a, a future where there will be many less jobs and so people will do not have these opportunities anymore. Now, I'd like to pause for a second because the more I speak, the more then I ask myself, what is good in, into this? I mean, why is this something that is good? And also, you know, I still remember that one of the, one of the points that Leontief made was that if forces would vote, um, you know, back in, in nine, let's say, 1880, 1890, would vote for the Democratic Party, maybe the horses would still be part and the leading part of the labor formation in the world. Um, but I'm afraid that although we're not horses, if we can vote, I'm afraid we cannot stop it, right? And so let's pause for a second and, and ask ourselves, is, is this good for us? And yes, as Professor Schwarzenegger said before, I think it's very good. I think the advantages uh, we're having through this kind of change in this society are impressive. The medical advantages, uh, the advantages in uh, the services we get, the simplification of our life, the quality of life that we can live, the security of our life. I mean, a lot of discussions today are about military security. Military, of course, is already making a massive use of AI and will do even more in the future. Um, it will create wealth, absolutely, yes. We will all be, or we will all have a chance around the world to be outside of poverty. Uh, but it, it still leaves us with the three issues that I mentioned before, inequality, concentration of power, and lack of purpose. Now, um, the story um, that we have had so far on inequality hasn't been particularly uh, successful. Um, <clears throat> in the future, with the growth of computer and with AI replacing humans, there will be also very simple issues. So I said the society is gonna be wealthier, for sure. But how would you tax a computer? How would you distribute this wealth from a bunch of computers to individuals? How would that happen? What is the way in which the society will redistribute the resources? That is very much unclear today, and it's probably something that has not even thought yet. Um, the, the, age of, the age of labor, as we called the last two centuries, where intellectual capital was the main capital that we all wanted to have, is probably coming to not an end, but to a decline. And today, um, out of the two different things that we can have, intellectual capital or financial capital, um, the trend is completely, is completely opposite. Intellectual capital is losing its importance and then losing its value, and financial capital is growing in value. Look at all the investments that every company, our company included, our insurance company included, are making on systems, computer, machines. And on the people's side, the best you can say is that you're holding the employment level which is not precisely the same story. So if you make an analysis of where is intellectual capital today, where is financial capital today, they're going in opposite direction and financial capital is growing. But financial capital is even more unequal than intellectual capital. And the spread and the concentration of intellectual, uh, financial capital is scary. Um, now, what, what can we say then about division, and I'm trying to uh, not take too much of your time and leave time for questions. So I do see a world in the future where the weight, the relevance of what was important for two centuries, brain, mind, intellectual capital, will be diminished. 
I see also a world where um, inequality will be much stronger, and I see a world where um, we will have to carefully manage super powerful private companies. Now, how do, how do we tackle these things? And this is where I want to drive uh, my discussion uh, to the end. And of course, I have no solution, but this is probably where we have to align each other because nobody has a, sing a, a simple solution for this. So, of course, education has a big role to play. Um, Professor Schwarzenegger uh, said that already. I mean, people can be educated. And as I said, not every work is affected in the same way. And actually, it's not even the old work. It's typically tasks. So what AI is doing is not that it's making the job disappearing. It's making the tasks disappearing. But then with the task disappearing, eventually even the job positions disappear. So what can be done there? Educate the people and move them towards tasks, activities, which are less likely to be uh, disrupted by computers. Um, the, second, the second thing that uh, we can do um, is more about the governance and the organization around our societies. Now, for different reasons, uh, one thing is happening already and goes precisely in this direction, and this is that we're all building bigger roles for states. Um, now, I come from, from, from an education and an age and a culture where a bigger role for state doesn't sound good at all. I mean, I was educated when I was young that uh, private is better and that public is scary. Uh, but I do, I do see today that um, everything is going in the opposite direction. Um, we need big states, big government to manage this transition. We need big states, big government to protect us, to give us security and safety. Um, and we need big states and big government also to manage the transition to a sustainable planet. We can do it alone by ourselves. So I'm afraid that uh, we will see, I'm afraid because that's, that's where I stand culturally, that we will have to rely much more than before on government, states, a public organization to drive this change through the society. The most difficult thing is the last one. How do we give a sense of purpose to all of us? How do we humans live? And we have been working all our life, you know, from you know, the, the, the Neanderthal of time to today, we have been making of work all our life, whatever that work was. I mean, it could have been hunting, it could have been taking care of the families, but that was all we did. Um, it won't be uh, necessarily the future, it won't be for everybody the future, for sure. So how do we balance things? And how we create a, a proper sense of purpose? Now, I hear, I read that leisure will become more important, but I don't think leisure is a replacement. I think leisure makes, uh, is a fantastic thing if you have a weekend and then you know that the, the Monday is coming. But if leisure is all you have, I don't think that solves, solves the issue. Um, we, we also need to adjust ourselves to a world where people will get in and out from the job market. They will participate and then have some uh, empty times and then they will go back. Um, difficult. That's very difficult. So I think we can educate. I think we can all together make sure that uh, the role of government is helpful and not harmful. Um, I think we can find ways to manage this, the superpower of private organization. Um, <clears throat> hopefully, we can find ways, although difficult, to um, evenly distribute wealth um, across the societies. The thing where I'm um, very um, short of solutions is how are we going to live in the future with a strong sense of purpose in uh, societies which are so different. And that also tells me why, among many other things, it has become so important over the last years, the, uh, the mental health. I mean, we've been investing a lot in mental health ourselves for our colleagues, for the, their families, and then of course also for our customers. But then I keep asking myself, why is this an issue today? I think it's an issue for lots of reasons, not just for this one. But I think it is also because uh, we are already perceiving 
the development of something completely new for us, for humans, for a race which has been on this planet for many thousand years. Um, and we, we will remain um, on the planet, but with a different role. And this creates anxiety, and this anxiety is frankly justified. So I'm, I'm, I don't want to close on this because it would be sad, and in a sense, um, it would take down everybody. Um, let, me, let me close instead on what, what we are doing, because I think, although I did not mention a private solution, I think everybody has a duty, really, to bring a contribution to this. So a couple of years ago, actually four years ago, we, um, we issued a labor statement. Um, unilaterally, we communicated to um, all our colleagues and employees that uh, we would commit to create and maintain as much as possible um, opportunities for them to be employed, which means we will invest in their training and education. And as much as possible, we will do our best to give them opportunities with us. I cannot promise anybody that we will employ people for, for life. That's, that's, that would be silly of me, and I, I would be lying. But I can do my best to create the conditions by which the people will have a job, if not with us, with somebody else. And we've been relying on this, and we've been checking on this, and we, we, we have been working on this. Now, if you look over the past years, actually we've been growing our number of employees. So you would say nothing bad is happening. That's true, but at the same time, honestly, we have been growing the perimeter of the business. Um, and at the same time, yes, so we have been introducing AI and we've been innovating. And so the private responsibility of doing everything you can to provide the private solution to this uh, public issue, to this issue of the society, to this issue of all of us, I think is needed. And so I'm still very proud and happy that we made that step. I think it was the right step, and we're still very committed to continue to uh, create opportunities for our colleagues over the next years to have a job, potentially with us, hopefully with us, but if not, with others. I'd like to pause here, and I hope I wasn't too gloomy. <laughs> very much. Um, what a frank and honest speech about a feature that awaits us and uh, what a wake-up call, I think, for us all to think about how we all can do our part, as you said, to really contribute to shaping a future of work given the developments we all witness. You started uh, by talking uh, about horses, so I do have to uh, ask a quick question about that, if I take the liberty here to ask a few questions first, perhaps, but then we invite you all to also ask questions, and uh, please raise your hand. We have microphones that will be uh, passed around the room, so you'll be receiving a microphone in case you uh, want to raise a question. Yeah. Back to the horses. <laughs> I wonder, you know, um, whether you would say that this is true, as you said, for low-wage workers or for things that perhaps the horses have done in the past and so on. But what about leaders? You know, we call this lecture series Leadership in the Future of Work. Would you say your job could one day be replaced by artificial intelligence, potentially? Could it be assisted, supported? Um, hard to say today, potentially. Hard to say today. Now, Take a different job, take lawyers, right? What artificial intelligence does is that we still need the lawyers to go into court. We still need the lawyers to argue and defend um, their clients. But all the, prep the preparation, um, all the research work, and even the writing, you know, can be done by computers, and it's done already by computers. It's fast, it's effective, it's complete. Um, so you still have the, the lawyers, but they do a different job. Um, so my job will change, or the job of my successors. Mm. It will change. Um, will Zurich Insurance in 20 years have a CEO? Yes, I presume yes, and will be a human. Um, 
B by the way, by the way, I mean, um, you, you can all touch me, I'm real, but you shouldn't be sure anymore today, right? Everything you see, um, you should have a strong guess that it's not real, right? Because, uh, you know, my voice can be very easily imitated, which means that all the voice recognition system, face recognition systems, security systems we have needs to be rethought, right? So I, I, my answer would be yes, but it would be very different. It's very interesting that the role of leaders, therefore, is uh, changing. It's changing and that, that leaders need to find a way to uh, operate with these, these new technologies. At the same time, you know, in the leadership education at the University of Zurich, we always say one thing that's really important for leaders, and I think you would endorse that perhaps, is to provide people with a sense of purpose not just for themselves individually, but for yeah. what they do together as a group, as a company, right? Um, given that that's one of the challenges, right? Um, how do you see leaders playing a role in sort of like helping people identify that purpose when technology is taking that perhaps away from them? Yeah, it's a great question. And the truth, the, the, the short answer is I don't know. Because the truth is, we don't know what, where, where we're going. That's the problem, right? We're heading into a totally different society and sum this up with uh, the other things that are happening. I mean, geopolitical uh, rebalancing. Um, so it, it is not just this one. Um, and um, all the changes that we have into the way we live for sustainability and the things that we will need to. So it's all happening at the same time. And I don't think anybody understands what's happening, um, what, what's the final destination of all this. Um, so I, I think what is important today is first of all to be mindful and not to put uh, the head in the sand um, and deny. Um, the second thing is listen, talk, uh, be open, and, uh, and, and understand what people are going through. And don't try to use the solutions of the past because quite Frankly, they don't work anymore already today. Hmm. It is just a different world already today. Um, again, I'm speaking out of an industry which is strongly impacted. Um, and maybe there are industries which will be less impacted, although I don't know which one. Because, you know, if you think about, um, you, you would easily think that this is going to go across the board pretty much everywhere. Absolutely. We have gathered a group of leaders here in this room, yeah. either current leaders who are already in roles of leadership or uh, our future leaders, some students. Uh, what do you say in terms of skill development? What, what would you advise them perhaps to invest most into now with all these trends coming up and you know, all the uncertainty attached to it, the limited time we have to educate ourselves, to upskill and so on, where would you place an emphasis, especially for the leaders that are here in this room? I, well, first of all, I think, I think it's always true that uh, do what you like. I mean, because um, you cannot do anything else than that. So if you, don't, if, if you don't have a passion, don't do it. If you don't really believe that it's worth doing it, leave it there and do something else or do nothing. It's better than doing something that you don't like. Um, now, among the things that you like, um, clearly... I connect it with, with purpose. More and more, job is not something that you do because you have to. Job is something that you do and you will do because you have a passion for, you have skills for, and you really want to do it. Um, so, you know, the image of years ago of the, um, you know, administrative clerk who is leaving uh, the house in the morning, uh, already annoyed and dreaming about coming back home, that doesn't exist anymore. Right? Um, so do a job with purpose, do it with all your skills, train yourself as best as you can, and, and, and keep the passion for it. Because if, if you miss that, then, then it's, gonna be, it's gonna be even harder. Um, but living at a time of changes like this one, uh, I guess the most important thing is what I said before, do something that you like and do it with passion. And the future is unknown today, which is interesting. Um, I, wish, I wish I had your age um, today, uh, but uh, um, I have another one. 
Uh, and so I can help, I can, I can make a speech, uh, but the future is yours and you're gonna build it. And with this, I think we need to give the audience, you all, the leaders that have convened tonight, the voice and we see the first hand going up. come to my mind, but um, I could easily experience after this uh, time of going in the home office that directly after it, people were saying, okay, now we all will stay in the home office. And I think in your industry, I have a hairdresser who opened his shop in front of your building and he told me nobody's going anymore. They are all there. In my case, we have a production company of a couple of thousand people. Uh, I must say, looking back now, it's almost where we were. Of course, there's more flexibility, but imagine that half of our people are working in production. What is there? Nothing changed. Digitization was anyhow something we invested so, for example, at the end of the production line, there's automatic packaging and things, but nothing happened there. And it was a big challenge that in between, people were saying, administration can work from home and workers have to come to the factory every day, do this horrible testing 20 times a day and whatever, and now it's all gone, like a bad dream. A leader, should answer the question, what can we learn from that? Because after the pandemic, all of our leaders, I don't mention anybody here, were thinking we're going into the new future. Is it really true for everybody? I'm not sure. Second, if you think of AI, I'm looking at movies and books written by AI, and I wonder, how about human touch? Will there be a time when people will realize that to read a book written by AI is completely worthless because it's missing the human touch? So what I'm saying is it's probably balancing trends. You are giving another one, which is big government. I could also say, haven't we seen big governments fail in most of the issues that we're dealing with? Don't Insecurity. Need to in security, in the military, yep. in the administration, everything. So it's we could another. also say Switzerland is an example that big governance can be a problem. It's almost another speech, huh? So yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think the question is sort of like, is this all a hype, right? Maybe oh, sort of like, no, no, no. I'm Look, um, I, I hear you and I wish it's, it, it were all true, but I, I don't think it is. I mean, take, a, take the problem you said, I mean, uh, what's nice in uh, reading a book not by a human? The problem is you won't recognize it. That's the problem. I mean, a young colleague of mine made a video of myself saying things that I never said, but they look like me. <laughs> and I just had to think about it and say, I never said that, because otherwise it was me. It was me just saying things that I never said. Now. It won't, it won't be possible anymore to recognize. And you know that fake videos is, uh, is already there. You know that uh, uh, political elections have been manipulated already by that, and they will continue to be manipulated. So the problem is that this border, which was once clear, you know, I am who I am, and you are who you are, with artificial intelligence is not clear anymore. And there can be a fake you and a fake me, exactly like us, just doing different things. So I don't think that this uh, thing that you say, the human touch, uh, it will be very difficult to give it a value to the human touch because what is the human touch really? Um, yes, I mean, if you touch the person next to you, that's a human touch. But everything else will be suspicious. It's the issue of a hallucination that this is creating. And we're very much concerned about it. I mean, because we want to keep a human touch with our customers in the work we do, right? But how you do it? And you have to be properly suspicious of every interaction you have, which is not just touching a person in front of you. You have to suspect that you're not speaking to a human. Um, on COVID, I'm 100% with you. I mean, I even during COVID, I stayed in lockdown as little as I could. And then um, 
you know, I came back to office uh, pretty much. Um, but I, I, I think it's a different story, that one. Um, I mean, I think COVID is, is, is a pandemic that, you know, especially the young people hopefully will forget. Maybe I will never, but because I will not have the time to forget, but maybe the people who were 20 years old um, in 2020 will forget it in 20, 30 years' time. Um, it's a special thing. So I wouldn't necessarily connect that. Um, and yes, I think, I think it's good to be back to work um, because it's socialization. There are lots of things about being at work, including getting energy from other people. I personally appreciate that. I mean, I, I want to see people because I need, I need to get their, their, their energy into me. Uh, but I, I would separate that. I, I agree with you, but, but I think it's a separate story. On government, I, I also agree with you, but I guess this is because we, we, we have an age. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. We have a question back in the room over here on this side. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Um, I recently um, just started to read um, a book which is called Work, Consumerism and New Poor. So which, um, I mean, remind me of what you have just mentioned. Work um, in the very beginning, it's, I mean, we are work, not just working for food anymore at this stage. Um, so there is a surplus of products um, and people, the competition is becoming more and more intensified because of the surplus of products. So that's the reason why people are going for consume, I mean, trying to identify themselves through um, consumerism, like trying to buy more uh, things or trying to identify themselves through the things they have purchased or the brands they're using or um, the, you know, dress, uh, dress, up like somebody else. So um, my question is that, do you think um, the, ge the generative AI um, will create more on this kind of um, surplus and thus um, create more new poor? The new poor mean, means that like um, people um, trying to work to consume more. So do you think AI will exacerbate this kind of situation? Yes, I think, I, think, I think it will. And the reason is that AI will tell you what you already know, because uh, the way you make the question, you will get more and more of the same answer. Now, again, make a simple case. Years ago, and probably you don't even know that, we used to read newspapers uh, which made of paper. Right now, with a newspaper that I, I know, I'm saying this because my I have I have two two sons, uh, two, actually one son, one daughter, two kids, and they never touch a newspaper in their life ever. Right, so they don't know what I'm talking about. But when 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 you had those those newspapers, you were scrolling the pages and you were finding things that you didn't expect. Today, instead, what well, what what do we do? We do we go on internet, and we look at applications at sites which will give us what we have seen yesterday, right? Because all is based on segmentation and profiling. And there is um, an intelligence behind that uh, profiles you and gives you what you're supposed to be interested in. And so you go deeper and deeper in the same thing, right? And it would be less and less likely that you can go in another direction. Now, the other question that I just want to make a quick reference to. You heard it in a number of countries, and frankly, Sw Switzerland on that was probably innovative uh, many years ago, that a number of countries introduced systems to help citizens, um, you know, with whatever you call it, public income, social income, citizens' income, whatever, right? Now, that's a way to make the poor less poor, or the people who don't have a job to be maintained by the society but it doesn't resolve the issue that you mentioned, neither resolves the purpose issue. Because I don't think anybody wants to be maintained by the community or for a long time. I think it's nice to know that there is a safe net around us, but it's not nice to know that we're gonna live out of the safe net. So these are the kind of things 
which I think will get worse and worse. Um, and artificial intelligence uh, will exacerbate all this very quickly, and it's already doing this. Fantastic. Thank you. We do have another question that was right here in the back, and then we'll move uh, further to the front. Um, thank you, Mr. Greco, for being here. Uh, my question is about the insurance industry. Um, if people sit at home, drive to work less, then do you expect significant shifts in the insurance industry in terms of number of contracts or, let's, as you said, mental health will be more risky? but some other risk will be less, and some others will significantly shift? Yes, of course. I mean, the industry is changing, and there are many other things happening. Uh, the relevance of natural catastrophes and weather events is much higher today compared with years ago. Um, at the same time, after pandemic, everybody is much more aware than ever before about life risks, about health, about uh, diseases. Um, you know, for many years, it really did not catch our mind that uh, we could get sick and die. Um, and we only thought, you know, cancer is the risk, but cancer is relatively low probability. And then you get a pandemic and you understand how easy it is to get a virus that can kill you. Um, and so things change. And yes, I mean, in the future, all of us will, mobility will be more, much more limited than it is today. Uh, because we will not have a nice diesel engine to drive uh, 2,000 kilometers if we want to do it. Um, and because also the world, in a sense, is getting smaller these days, right? Um, some years ago, the world seemed almost infinite, and people were easily traveling from one part of the world or another. But uh, geopolitics, sustainability issues, uh, and these changes are making the world a little smaller. And so the people will travel less and will be more close to their, to their communities, to their homes, but still they will have different, uh, different needs. I think more and more insurance will become about servicing and more and more will become about preventing. I mean, the bad thing about insurance is that um, if for centuries insurance has been paying claims, but nobody wants actually, you know, the root of the claim. The claim is a bad thing. The claim means that you suffered something. So the best thing that we can do is have our client, our, our customers, to avoid the claims, so to prevent and avoid the need for that, which is, by the way, a much more interesting job for us too. It's much more fun. Uh, we're all better off. Um, so, yeah, the industry is changing quickly and, uh, and it's adapting, and we'll keep doing that. We have one more question right here from the front. <laughs> Hello? It's very short question. If we would be 30 years again and working with Zurich Insurance, where would you start your career or what would you do within the company? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I never had any idea about my career. I mean, I wanted to do completely different things in my life. And yeah, I, I never planned it. Um, you know, uh, when I was a kid, there's probably many kids in my, at my age, I wanted to be an astronaut and I wanted to, to go to the moon and I ended up being an insurance manager, so. <laughs> <laughs> and the final question, I think, will go to our actually very own vice president. Yes, turn the microphone. First question is uh, how does government deal with it? I mean, this is quite a tricky question. It is the lack of an international legal order that is the, the first problem that we have to resolve. And the second question about big government is: it sounds like China, you know, uh, does uh, big government um, use AI to control people or to limit uh, the application? So. These are quite very tricky questions, but uh, I, I, could you ex elaborate a little bit more on big government? Yeah, and, and definitely, um, I, 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 I think my inclination is the opposite of that. As I said before, I don't like big governments. I'm just saying I think it's inevitable at this point. Um, and let me focus on three things that we badly need these days. First of all, and most important than everything else, we need security. 
we cannot guarantee our security individually. We need governments to provide security, and maybe governments are not enough. We need, you know, international organization. We need NATO, for example, right? I mean, because Switzerland per se cannot do much, and maybe even Europe per se cannot do much. Um, and security is becoming more and more important. Every day we realize that. The second thing, um, uh, you know, we have a huge transformation of our world into a sustainable economy and a sustainable, a sustainable industry. There is no way this can be done by private. First of all, because we need a coordination, because whatever we do or we don't do has very little impact if the others do the opposite or, or don't do the things that they're supposed to do. And so we need governments there for that. And, um, and then the third thing is, as I said, I mean, there are equality issues or inequality issues, which are very substantial already today, and they're going to get worse and worse. Now, this has always been the role of governments to provide equalization solutions. Um, they've done poorly, they've done better in some cases, but it's not a private role. We cannot provide equalization solutions by ourselves. So I'm afraid that as it is happening already, we will see more and more space for governments and they will matter more. And I'm not even mentioning things like energy, which is gonna be the next one, or water, um, which is gonna be the next, the next problem that we will have, because we're gonna be short of energy and short of water, and we cannot s resolve these things by ourselves. We cannot drill the ground by ourselves and find the solutions, or not all of us can do it, and maybe Elon Musk can do it, but not, not the others. Um, now, you say something that I strongly, that I'm strongly fearful of. I mean, where is democracy in this? And usually big governments don't sound very democratic. Well, Switzerland is an exception. Um, maybe you would say that Switzerland doesn't have a, a big government, but Switzerland is a true democracy. Um, we need to care much more for um, the public aspect, the public well-being than we ever did. Um, I mean, at least in my life, I never cared, and I thought that this was something that others will do. Now I understand that I should care. Um, and so I think we should all become much more aware of this and much more aware of the need to do something about it. I, 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 I'm really afraid it's inevitable. I'm, I'm not particularly happy with that, uh, but I don't see a way to, to get away from it is happening already and it will accelerate without any pleasure in saying so. <laughs> There's a number of more hands up. One has been up for a very long time, so I would say we'll make that our final question for tonight. And then, of course, there's going to be room to discuss more. Oh, you have so a big responsibility, the final one. Am I? Yeah, yeah, here we go. Um, hi, I might be very controversial on that, but uh, taking up this question, how about DeFi? How about decentralized finance? How about that? How about taking the government out of the equation? How about thinking about a future? Let's say, not politically speaking, but merely economically speaking, without centralized finance. What do you think of that? I wish it would work. I am afraid it doesn't. <laughs> uh, take, take, for example, security, which today is a fundamental issue. How can you guarantee cybersecurity where even, even a country cannot do that? Um, you need super country um, organization to guarantee cybersecurity. Um, or take military security. How would you do that in a decentralized financial world? Again, I'm sadly saying so, because I am no supporter of big governments. But I think we're just heading there. Or take the sustainability transformation. How can you do it if you fragment this you know, across Europe, not just in 27 countries, but then in regions, states, you know, inside these 27 countries? And then keep doing for the rest of the world. It doesn't work. It's not going to work. So again, I'm afraid 
the bad thing is inevitable. And then we'd better cope making the bad thing not so bad. Um, but I don't think we're going to avoid that. Well, thank you very much. I think we'll need to leave it here for tonight. Thank you for thank your you. answers to the many questions. Thank you very much. <clears throat>